just 50 years, the surface ice of the Arctic Ocean has thinned by 40%. The northern coast of Ellesmere Island has lost 90% of its ice shelves. In 2005, it took just one hour for an iceberg the size of Manhattan and weighing an estimated 2 billion tons to break away from the Canadian Arctic coast. One of the largest unspoiled regions on Earth, the Arctic is warming up three times faster than the rest of the world. Experts estimate that it could take just another 50 years to be irreversibly transformed. In the 1960s, an expedition was organized whose scientific research is still used today to chart the regression of the ice. This year marks the 46th anniversary of the start of what was considered the last epic journey on Earth. In February 1968, four men and 34 dogs set off from Point Barrow on the northern edge of Alaska. Their aim, to complete the first surface crossing of the frozen Arctic Ocean. Leading the expedition was the late Wally Herbert. Lewis McNaught is his biographer. Wally Herbert really had a vision to do something really big. Going to the North Pole was not enough. Herbert's vision was that to cross the whole Arctic Ocean by its longest axis was something that nobody had ever done, nobody had even contemplated. And to just to cross to the North Pole per se was not enough for Wally Herbert. He had to do the bigger journey because that was the journey that other people would not be able to replicate. That was the journey that people would remember him for. By the time Wally Herbert, Alan Gill, Ken Hedges and Dr. Roy Fritz Kerner reached Spitsbergen, they travelled 3,620 miles. Their monumental journey had taken them 16 months. They'd become the first men to complete a surface crossing of the Arctic Ocean. However, their celebrity didn't last long. The tragedy of, of Wally Herbert's expedition was that about two, three weeks after they arrived in Greenland, Neil Armstrong stood on the moon and Wally Herbert's expedition literally fell into the shadow of the moon. The publicity, the profiling, the achievement that those four men dragging sledges across the whole of the Arctic Ocean just fell away from public view. And it's only recently that people have actually re um, evaluated the achievement, which was really quite extraordinary, has never been replicated and can now never be replicated because of what's happening with climate change and the Arctic Ocean. Following his death in 2007 at the age of 72, Wally Herbert's achievements as an explorer, artist and writer finally began getting the recognition they deserve. Without knowing what he was going to discover, without knowing what the conditions were going to be like, without knowing whether the achievement was going to be possible, he set out without a GPS, using quite primitive navigational equipment, quite basic navigational equipment, on a journey that everybody thought was impossible, using a mode of transport that a lot of people thought was outdated. And he achieved something that nobody else had ever done. That puts him up there with the greatest polar explorers of all time. Before Wally died, Transworld Sport interviewed Ranulf Fiennes, regarded as another of the world's foremost explorers. One of his greatest achievements came when he and project partner Charlie Burton became the first people to reach both the North and South Poles by surface travel. In my opinion, um, Wally Herbert is the, the greatest living polar traveller, not just from the United Kingdom, but from all the other great polar nations such as uh, Russia and Canada and France and Japan, and I suppose I better say Norway. So there, 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 is, um, a, there are a certain number of countries that turn out great polar travellers, but none of them um, who are still alive today um, exceeds the um, accomplishments of Wally, not only in the Arctic Ocean, for which he's perhaps more famous, but incredible journeys long before that down in Antarctica when he was with the British Antarctic Survey. The United Kingdom prides itself on its explorers. 
Penhaddo is the only Briton to have trekked without resupply to both geographic poles. There is no doubt in my mind that uh, Wally Herbert's crossing of the Arctic Ocean was one of the great polar expeditions of all time, full stop. The journey was the culmination of at least four years of planning by Wally, who'd lived with the native Inuit people to discover how to survive such inhospitable conditions. I mean, it's hard, of course. I was an adventurer, really. I was looking for the real big one. That was the thing. I wasn't interested even in the small ones, like crossing the Arctic Ocean by the shorter route was too small for me because my, my way of thinking in those days was that if I take the biggest, longest, hardest way first, then no one can possibly beat, beat us. My, my feeling is that the, at, the, at the time of setting off from Alaska was one of utter, utter fear because you know, I had the, 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 the responsibility, or at least I believed I had this responsibility for, the, for my colleagues' lives. Well, of course, they didn't need to come with me anyway, so if they came with me, it was at their own risk. Um, but I, I, could, I could see that they were all totally believing that I'd done my part of the deal thoroughly well, so that they were going to be perfectly safe. Well, there was no such thing as being perfectly safe on the Arctic Ocean, not in those days, or even today for that matter. Um, but, but in those times, you know, what we were making was a pioneering journey. No one had ever attempted it before. However, initially, things didn't go to plan. The problems at the early stages were, were, were quite unlike anywhere else in the Arctic Ocean because at that point on the Arctic Ocean, as we're talking about the coast of Alaska, the, the ice along that coast, the sea ice, is drifting past the coast very, very fast. It's about eight miles a, a day. In order to get onto the solid polar pack, you had to start early enough in the year when it was still dark. And so, you know, we were traveling onto the pack ice when it was moving very, very fast in the dark where you didn't, you couldn't really see which way to go, which way to jump because, you know, the, the ice was split open and it never split with a crack. It always split with a zipping sound, a slight zip, almost just a little whisper. And it would open up very, very quickly into a, into a gigantic lead, maybe a couple of hundred yards wide. And sometimes you, your dogs would be on one side and you'd be on the other. Because of mush ice and ice ridges, they struggled for the first 16 days, completing only 17 miles from Point Barrow. They were 400 miles behind schedule after less than three weeks. At one point during the expedition, Alan Gill slipped a disc in his back. The incident led to a falling out between Herbert and the committee in England that was backing the project. For Herbert, it was the lowest point of the 16 months. The committee felt that Wally was suffering from winteritis. It's quite normal when people are stuck in a very enclosed environment that tensions will inevitably result from the fact that insularity and, and trust in your own ability to survive very harsh conditions will not be shared by somebody who has no experience and doesn't have that trust in their own abilities to survive those conditions. So it's called winteritis. And it happens even now on short expeditions. On an expedition of 16 months in length, it was inevitable that it was going to arise. Herbert's dogged determination won through, and the expedition continued. The team set up a winter camp and prepared themselves for an Arctic Christmas. Throughout that harsh Arctic winter, glaciologist Dr. Roy Kerner continued his research on ice thickness, the size and type of ice flows, the rate of formation of new ice, and even air pollution in the Arctic. It made a major contribution to science that is only now being realized uh, as just how useful a contribution it was in the context of global warming. Um, the work that Fritz Kerner did provided the first and actually only data set that has ever been collected by direct surface measurement from one side of the Arctic Ocean to the other. And because it was done uh, in 1968, 1969, nearly 40 years ago, it provides a really valuable 
data set for when, when, when future data sets are collected, uh, and that's been done by submarines and, and, and by satellites, they can then start to look at the rates of thinning and shrinkage of the ice cap. Polar bears were one of the many dangers that the explorers faced. Another was the temperature. The human body simply isn't designed for minus 50 degrees Celsius. Your thinking speed is slowed up by about four times. 3.82, I believe, to be precise. So you are um, traveling in a hazardous environment trying to perform to your maximum on a footstep by footstep basis for 8 to 14 hours a day for months on end and your brain is slow and it's not concentrating on the things that it should be concentrating on and that is why most expeditions fail they make mistakes when they broke camp after the Arctic winter, the men made their way to the North Pole, reaching it on April the 6th, 1969. That was a climax, obviously, of the whole journey and of my whole life up to that time. But it wasn't actually a, a, a moment of great elation because we were too exhausted. We were absolutely exhausted by, by the efforts of getting there and by the frustration and the cold and so on. And so there was, it didn't actually even strike us properly until about three or four days later that we'd actually been to the pole. And, and then the messages started coming in by radio, congratulating us on something which we, we take really for granted. Wally and his team eventually reached Vesla Tavloya, a small rocky island off the northeast coast of Spitsbergen at 1900 hours on May the 29th, 1969. They had completed the greatest polar journey ever undertaken and become the first people to trek across the Arctic Ocean. The very moment he knew his particular odyssey had come to an end still affected Wally years after the event. Ken says, hold out your hands and close your eyes, which I did, and he put a piece of rock into my hand. The emotional impact of his epic journey had left its mark. A true trailblazer and visionary, Wally Herbert's achievement still ranks among the greatest triumphs of human endurance. <laughs>